yeah, the freedom of of picking what is that we want, right? That's probably the biggest sign of wealth, if you ask me. Have you been thinking about buying your first rental property for some time, or do you already own a bunch of properties? Well, fellow investors, you found the right location to listen and learn from other successes. Welcome to The Very Real Estate Effect with your host, Axel Monsaint-Jean. Hello, and welcome back to The Very Real Estate Effect podcast, a show dedicated to real estate investing everywhere. And today it's an honor again in the second episode of this part two series with my friend Rodrigo Parada. Hi, Rodrigo. Welcome back. Hi, Axel. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. This is episode two. In case you didn't um, listen to part one, last week we talked about some of the impact on the financing and uh, from the CMHC that have been announced in the last couple of weeks. And we discussed how this is impacting some of our projects. And this week we wanted to take a little bit of time because it's reoccurring that we constantly have to adapt. In real estate, you never know what the end of the story is going to be. You have a plan. But it always changes. And we want to share with you how important it is to be able to change the narrative and make the right decisions. So we talked about some of the financing impacts that it's had on your project. You're working on three or four projects in, uh, in Alberta, multifamily. Um, how, how does it impact you? And, from, and I'm not saying that from a financing point of view, but from a, a, a project management and mindset point of view. How does it impact? Um, so the biggest impact that, that happened for us is this realization and, and basically this, this confirmation that we needed to communicate better with our investors. So in uncertainty, right, the, the thing that calms and appeases everybody that's involved is the flow of information and making sure that we're all on the same page, right? Um, as you've said numerous times on, on this podcast, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm actually using it all the time, but a, a, a partnership is, is just like a marriage, right? Yeah. And, and you have to date first. You date you're, and then you get married. Right? Yeah. But also, once that's done, what's one of the most important factors in a marriage? It's communication, yeah. right? So uh, when this was happening... You know, what we did is we we uh, we reached out to our investors and we made sure that everybody was understanding what was going on. But when we figured out the path forward, we proactively shared that information with them. Not necessarily because for us it was something incredibly positive. That's always a plus. Mm -hmm. But we want to make sure that they understand where we're going, how we're getting there, and that we're all focusing our energy toward the same focal point, right? Yeah. So... Uh, proactive communication, clear communication. Um, if you need to change your objectives or your timelines, don't wait. Yeah, you know, just share it with everybody as much as you can. And luckily for us, for for the projects that we have over there, the outcome is 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 turning out to be better than what we initially planned. So, in this particular case, um, it's adapting for the better. Yeah, but. In the case of the other opportunities that I had um, here, well, it's taking the opposite, right? So I'm, I'm, I need to readapt my exit. I need to readapt um, the product that I'll be looking to bring to 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 my small circle of influence mm -hmm. and see if we want to go forward with it. So I think that in a nutshell, that's pretty much it. You need to learn how to communicate clearly during these troubled times yeah. to make sure that the team is on board and understands. Um, where the leadership is, is taking this. And especially depending on the structure that you have for your projects, if you have some active partners and some passive partners, the active partners, by definition, they're active. They know what's going on. They're involved into the day-to-day. -day. For them, it's just a normal day in the office, basically. But for those who are a little bit more passive, that may not be as involved. You know, maybe they, they get an update once a month, once every two months. For them, it may be a little bit more of a surprise. And if you've been thorough in your partner selection process, you have prepared them that things don't always go as planned. Things happen. Mm -hmm. And it's the ability to, as you said, like properly communicate it because they can take the bad news. They'll understand. Nothing is linear, especially in what we're doing where we, there's so many factors that we don't control. But it's just that if we don't share it with them and they learn about it later on, then just like in a marriage, just like in any other company or organization, then it just kind of 
breaks the bond. It kind of breaks the trust. And then it's like, well, why didn't you tell me that? I can understand that things are different now, but it would have been nice just for you to let me know. Yep. And so, as you said, like those those projects and partnerships are are like a marriage and you really need to be able to share the good news, also share the bad news because they'll understand, especially for the bad news. There's almost this aversion in wanting to share this, but hey, shit happens. No, that's it. It's what we do about it. Exactly. It's, and it's how we handle it. And it's sometimes in the, in the tougher moments that we have to be even more proactive to, to communicate it out to our, our close community and those who are involved. We were talking about this with Rosalie, my amazing wife and partner in real estate, where sometimes what we feel is difficult is the ability is, is that pro projects always change. And I'll give you an example. Actually, that's a property that you know because you, you, you have one fairly close to this. We have a, the fourplex in Laval. We bought this two and a half years ago. It took us nine months to get the permit. We finally renovated. We Originally, this was to keep important to put in the portfolio, and we thought we would just you know refinance it after the construction and stabilization and hold it for a few years. Then, while well, we had a partner in there, we needed to pay them back. Uh, we thought, okay, we thought, let's just, too bad, let's just sell it. We listed it. It was on the market. We couldn't get the price we wanted. Yeah, we were aggressive in our price. Like we wanted, a f you know, the basically the full value. Uh, it didn't sell. And then we were able to refinance and go from there. So in the end, we did repay back our partner. Everything was good. But it's just that the scenario in the on, and the exit on this project, I think, changed about three or four times. Yep. And so constantly have to readapt. What does that mean? Let's redo the numbers. Where do we go from there? Communicate that to our partner. And that's something that you and I have discussed in the past is how for real, real estate investors, the importance of being able to adapt and keep making good decisions without knowing what the end of the story is. Absolutely. And, and you know, to your point, I think that it would be a mistake to look at a project with one specific exit because there's always going to be external factors, yeah. whether it's in the market, whether it's in you know, requirements from the people involved in, in, in the actual deal that are gonna be constantly changing, right? That's- th That you don't only, control. That's it, the only constant in mm -hmm. the world is that there's going to always to, uh, going to be change, right? So it's our ability to welcome that newfound information, to adapt to it, to properly communicate it, but always to focus on what we're trying to achieve or what we set out to achieve, right? So, you know, to your point, I, I recently had uh, a transaction close. We sold one of our triplexes in Brownsburg when initially when we made that acquisition with, with my family, um, it was going to be a buy and hold forever, mm -hmm. right? So there's nothing bad with pivoting. There's nothing bad with adapting to the constant changes. I think it's more of a it's more of a reflection of your capacity as as a leader to adapt to it and to still get the maximum out of the situation. Yeah. The beautiful thing about what we do and in the industry that we're in is real estate is a forgiving asset in the sense that over time. It, over time. Over time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So even if that acquisition, it's not the ideal mm -hmm. acquisition or throughout the optimization stabilization, it doesn't go exactly as planned. If you hold it long enough, you'll be okay. Oh yeah. Um, so with having that knowledge in mind, then it should relieve most of the stress that we normally feel when we're in the trenches, when we're dealing with with hardships, because you're gonna be fine, you know? And it's, it's gonna be okay. You just have to decide what is the compromise that you're okay with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the beauty of this capacity to adapt is really strengthened by the quality of the people surrounding you. So you were mentioning like the different partners that we're, we're, we're involved with. Um, I've made a conscious decision to surround myself with people that have a different skill set than I do. And by extension, that means that they don't deal with situations the same way that I do. So I believe that I'm a rational person and whenever something happens, I, I try to look at it coldly, mm -hmm. stick to the facts. I don't think that's the same thing with all my partners and that's perfectly fine because it forces me to become better at what I do well, but then I'm also able to depend on them to yeah. bring something up in those moments that's going to help me um, focus on the positive and the end result. Do you feel that it's something that 
you've had to to go through also on on your end and and readapting with with the people around you and 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 how you you visualize the exit let's say constantly yeah and de depending on the project and and what's at stake and what the priority is and it, it I was thinking about it when you mentioned, you know, you had to sell the the triplex in 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 Brownsburg, and originally this was like a buy and hold for forever with the family. Multiple things. One, I find it's interesting a few years later to look at ourselves back three years, for example, when you made that acquisition, and where you were at and how you thought about it then of, oh, this is a great asset. I'm going to hold it forever. I'll pass it to my kids. By then, it'll be paid and blah 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 and It's not like there's. It was a good decision or a bad decision to sell it. It's just that it was the decision that corresponded to where you were at at that point now, because you made that decision now for an mm -hmm. asset that you bought three years ago. And I was going to say the only thing I find that matters to this is for you to be aligned with the long term vision. Because, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you're into real estate to build long term wealth. Now, three years ago, that maybe looked like buying triplexes in Quebec. And now it's maybe more like buying 24 unit buildings in Alberta. You're still achieving your goal, your goal even faster. Uh, and, and it makes sense to maybe get rid of this earlier property that you've kind of gone through a full cycle. You bought it, you optimized it, you know, thank you, goodbye. Maybe now your, your opportunity for that capital is way higher and it totally makes sense to sell this. So, because I've, I've, I've had people say, It, exactly as as you mentioned, like no, you bought this and you're supposed to hold it forever. Yeah, but things change. We adapt. Like it doesn't make sense to have that equity locked in there when the opportunity cost is is higher in another in another place. And I feel like it took me a little while to get comfortable with this. That hey, everything changes. It's okay to adapt your strategy, your your tactic to follow the long term strategy. And another project that we've had, like I've talked hours on this podcast about our Saint Jérôme project. If you're not aware, you, we we bought two pieces of land, two plots for an, a 16 unit. Uh, we made the acquisition of the lot next door. We had a zoning change. We actually got the final approval from the city for a 43. We closed the the the, the third parcel recently, and I was like, "That's it. I'm kind of I've I've had it. I want to sell it." And now I'm like. No, you know what? I still want to do it. And <laughs> and I don't know what's going to happen yet. It's just that I keep making all the decisions to have all the opportunities open because I don't know what the final exit is going to be, but I want to make sure that I have the choice. Yep. And that's something that you and I have talked a lot when we're, you know, in the car or canoeing is or sailing is the fact that we have the choice because some people don't. Yeah. Yeah, the freedom of of picking what is that we want, right? That's probably the biggest sign of wealth, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not forced to do anything. I just have to make the right decision. That's an incredibly powerful thought, you know? So the going back to your point about that, that, that disposition of the asset, yep. I think that it is a very, we're really limiting ourselves in our capacity to achieve bigger things if we just stay rigid in our thinking And, you know, that got me thinking because when I made that acquisition three to four years ago, I was an investor at a specific level of knowledge. But what happened in that time frame? Yeah. I, I networked more. I yeah. met people. I got coached. I became a coach. I got exposed to different things. Obviously, I am not the same person, but uh, even more, I'm not the same investor that I was back then. So... The moment that you start seeing more and more opportunities and, you know, any, I believe any intelligent person, rational person will be able to determine the cost of opportunity. Well, you end up realizing that maybe like that project was successful in itself, but maybe it's better if we just take up uh, uh, another level by disposing of it. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. These are assets. Assets, they're bought, they're acquired and they're disposed of, yeah. whether you're a single Um, investor or you're a fund mm -hmm. or you're a business or you're a REIT, whatever it is, no. that's the cycle, no. right? And if you're able to manage all of these transactions with 
you know, the fiduciary duty that you're always doing the right thing for your partners and potential investors, you'll be fine because every decision can be explained. Yeah. And I, I like what you said about, about the asset because now I, it's like, don't get attached. It's just a piece of land. It's just a building. It's, I remind myself that it's a, uh, an investment vehicle. You get attached to your mutual funds. Well, I don't have any more mutual funds. I'm, I'm, I'm done with all of this. But like, do you get attached to your Ber Berkshire shares? Well, ah, Berkshire maybe actually. <laughs> <laughs> Bad example. But like, there are certain things like that. It's just an investment vehicle. Yep. And it makes sense at some point. Then it doesn't make sense anymore. It's okay. Move on. <clears throat> make the right decision as long as you're aligned with your long-term strategy. That's exactly it. It's it's kind of like you you mentioned sailing, right? That's one thing. Like, um, shout out to Axel, amazing sailor. I don't know anything about sailing, but the one thing that I learned on on the time that we went out is, you know, you have a focal point. You have a point on the horizon that you're trying to get to. But the thing that we had to go through is we lost wind. At one point, we yeah. had to adapt the sail. We had to flip it, twist it. We had to zigzag mm -hmm. on the Saint Laurent <laughs> to get to where we were going. But I think that's the perfect analogy to what we're talking about today because you're going to move left. You're going to go right. You're going to, you know, you're going to have to potentially put your, 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 your hands in, in the water and, you know, uh, move a bit with it. But at the end of the day, you're still going towards that same point. And that yeah. same point is either profitability, a bigger thesis in your investment, or a, a bigger goal, right? So I think that's a, it's a wonderful subject and idea, and it's a challenging one. The, the, the whole concept of, of reevaluating yourself and reevaluating your capacity to do these projects and your ability to, to, to take on bigger and bigger goals, right? Because it, it goes with what I believe is one of my life's goals is I just want to be a better version of myself, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Business with a capital B is a constant way for us to challenge ourselves um, in terms of our technical knowledge, but also who we are as individuals, as human beings. And that's basically why I keep on doing the things that I'm doing them. I'm doing uh, them, you know, like um, there's no right or wrong as long as you're doing it for the sake of your investment, your investors, and yourself. Yeah. And for the, for the right reasons. And, you know, for those who are listening and, and starting out and maybe just looking to buy their first triplex, their first sixplex, you know, one of the things on that is I just want to remind you that Rodrigo and I have been doing this for years. And so, you know, we don't have 40 years of experience yet as developers. It's, it's more recent. In my case, it's about five, five, six. It's just that We educated ourselves. You know, you mentioned like you got coached and then you coached others and it forces you to have these conversations to help others. But somewhere it helps you, too, because then you have to think about it and be like, am I actually doing what I'm preaching? Am I thinking about it that way? And <clears throat> excuse me, the um, the advice to me for for those who are beginning is invest in yourself, learn, learn, learn and trust your gut, because I think there's a lot of people out there who are fully capable, but they almost overthink it. And as you said, it does forgive over time. So obviously, I'm not saying this to go overpay on anything, but like I've seen people wanting to buy a sixplex and in the end they choked out for 15K on the purchase price. And I remind them like three years down the road, do you really care about that 15,000? No, you're just happy that you finally invested and bought a place and the appreciation will have been four times that amount so who cares that's it that's so true and you know if you need to focus on one thing initially when you're starting out you got to be okay with the idea that you got to get as fast as possible comfortable with being uncomfortable yeah. and also that um, at the end of the day what really matters is is what you're setting out to achieve for yourself mm -hmm. so nothing is perfect Perfection doesn't exist. It's really up to us to adapt to whatever is being thrown at us and to make the maximum of it, you know? Yeah. It's not win or lose, it's win or learn. Mm -hmm. and, and just enjoy it. You'll have fun, for sure. You'll have fun. And you, you, you summarized it really well. Like The one takeaway that I want you to take from this episode is that in real estate investing, you have to be comfortable in the uncertainty. You don't know how it's going to end up. 
but you have to keep making good small decisions so you have as many positive options available to you. And the ability to ev evolve in that uncertainty is actually difficult. Sometimes it's nerve wracking. <clears throat> you don't know what's going to happen, but guess what? You just have to keep going and those small positive incremental decisions will make it all worth it because then again, I close the full circle, you'll have the choice. It's just that if you lock yourself out of certain possibilities and exit methods, then by definition, you'll be forced in a corner where you maybe didn't want to end up. Well said, my friend. There you go. Rodrigo, thank you very much for your participation today. I always enjoy having you on. And by the way, like we have these conversations as we go sailing or kayaking or whatever. So at least like you guys get to benefit today. Um, if people want to reach out to you and get in touch, what's the best way to do so? Instagram, Rodrigo underscore at Astra. Uh, on Facebook and LinkedIn, it's my name, Rodrigo Parada. Send me a DM. Let's connect. Whatever I can do to provide value or help out, I'll be more than happy to do so. And... Please share this episode with a friend who could benefit from this conversation. There are people around you who are looking to start investing in real estate. They may not have the confidence to do so. And it's always been the objective of this podcast to bring you some quality information so you can start as well. It had a big impact on our lives and we want to help you do so. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you next week. And reminder, keep researching your market and make some offers. Thank you. Mm -hmm.